Remnant Rise from Ashes is one of a few games that takes the trappings of the Souls-like genre to reimagine a third-person shooter. Everything from wide and vertical maps to cramped corridors, from the growling of enemies in the distance ready to charge, to enemies that quietly sneak up to attack you. From the slow pace of gathering resources, to the mercilessly fast-paced shootouts, all culminating into a spine-shivering and blood-boiling game. However, the story and setting of Remnant, at first glance, seems disjointed. In a post-apocalyptic sci-fi setting, the narration and characters progress the story in esoteric, shamanistic verse befitting high fantasy. Item descriptions advance some characters' feelings or expand on the mood and atmosphere for the setting, but do not deliver on important facts to build on the world. But as we travel from one world to another and explore the settings of each, a theme of a stalwart assertion of individual rights emerges from antagonists that deny them. The first world is, of course, Earth, where a world-devouring entity called the Root has taken hold. We come to a research facility turned bunker called Ward 13, discover that the pre-apocalypse research center invited the Root, and we set out to find the founder of Ward 13 to reach a different research facility and sever Earth's connection to this giant evil tree. The only problem is that the founder is lost, because he started hopping between between worlds to defeat the Root as well. The first world we chase to is called Rom, a world without any presence of the Root, but inhabited by violent tribes called the Buri and isolationist peoples called the Vir. Both are ruled by a mysterious, reclusive figure called the Undying King, who saved the planet from the Root. There is a certain quote by a Roman historian, Gaius Publius Tacitus, hailed as one of the foundational historians of the past along alongside the likes of the Greek Herodotus. The quote is attributed to a speech by Calgacus, critiquing Roman warfare in Tacitus's book The Agricola. The quote reads, to ravage, to slaughter, to usurp. Under false titles, they call empire, and where they make a desert, they call it peace. This quote directly inspired the setting of Rom. Through dialogue and notes in the world, we can learn that the Undying King set his entire world on fire, quite literally turning it into a desert, to defeat the Root. He named himself King and enslaved the Vir to enforce his rule. He may have defeated the Root, but any sense of freedom and self-determination were defeated with it. If, however, you agree to help further safeguard his planet, he will open a door to a new world called Corsus. In Corsus, we find a swamp filled with fungal-infested and bug-like humanoids, infected with a parasite called the Voxworm. As we read notes left by former inhabitants, we see people expressing feelings of loneliness and isolation that are symptomatic of depression, only for those same people to express hope in a woman called the Iskal Queen. People abandon their communities to escape their problems and join this queen. Upon the player meeting her, she offers you, a Voxworm Parasite, to become one with the Iskal. The Corsus setting is reminiscent of the sort of strategies that cults employ to build their followings and prey on the vulnerable, targeting people with mental illness or emotional distress, offering a solution but only if you abandon your family and your friends, your society, your name. Like a cult, the Iskal paint your individuality and specific circumstances as the cause of problems in your life, but only introduce even greater problems to keep you socially dependent on them. After moving past the Iskal Queen and defeating this world's boss, we return to the Undying King, who gives us a key to the Labyrinth and in turn a passage to the final world, Yaisha. Once on Yaisha, we find ourselves embroiled in a civil war. On one side is an oligarchy of formerly immortal nobles who maintain their rule through a facade of still being immortal. And on the other side is a ragtag band of freedom fighters seeking self-governance. The resistance helps us by informing the player that the founder of Ward 13 is being held prisoner by the king. We kill the king, win individual liberties for the resistance, and find the founder, who gives us a key to the research lab that houses the Earth's connection to the root. 
We return to Earth, teleport to the other research labs, and confront the Root in one final battle. We connect to the Root and hear it speak to us directly as it soliloquies that our individual lives are not worth living compared to the peace that comes with complete collectivist unity. Then we kill the connection, hop on a boat, and head home. Remnant Rise from Ashes equates protecting one's own life with the protection of individual rights. But beyond that, the game seems to not have any mechanics or player statistics that significantly engage with this theme. The completion of story objectives rarely evokes a change or reaction from non-player characters or their settings. Still, the game has an extremely enjoyable, shorter experience, and has systems for multiplayer that are more enjoyable than most Souls-like games. Games, it is well worth your time. Thank you for watching, my friends. In the Philosophy of Games series, we look at games as a work of scholarship and explore the unique potential games have to allow players to engage with philosophy. Would you like to chat with other like minded people about games? Then join the Soccer Tetris Discord server with the link in the description. You can also support the channel on Patreon, where you will gain early access to video scripts, where your critiques and feedback will directly shape future videos and the future of this channel. And if you enjoyed this video, if you found value in it, then you will also enjoy our video on Sekiro and the ethics of rejecting the notion of immortality. Thank you again, I will see you in the next video, and stay true.